What's up, Rich, man? Good to have you on. It's good to be here. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, as I said that, I was like, rich man, rich man, but but Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, with, with my life, with, with my wife and my family, I am a very rich man. I love that, man. What a way to start. You know, I, I want to start actually, um, I want to start with that. What, is your, what does your life look like right now as far as family goes? Um, as of right now, um, between me and my wife, we're both, you know, this is our second relationship. We've both in 20 year relationships before that. So with her kids, my kids, and then the child we have together, we have 10 kids, nine girls, one boy. Uh, we have five of them that are at home, ranging from seven months old to two 18 year olds getting ready to go off to college. Uh, she's going back to school to become a nurse practitioner. And I'm a carpenter working on getting my own business completely going so I can quit the nine to five grind and work for myself. 10 kids. I mean, so what, what's hot, what are holidays? Like what's the dinner table? Like, oh man, well, it's not just holidays there for a long time up until we kind of all spread out over, you know, hours away from each other. It was 24 people every Sunday at the house for Sunday dinners. What do you, you feed know? everybody? <laughs> oh, every, everything. Well, it was always a, it was always a big event. It's like a family reunion every Sunday. Oh my gosh, man. That is crazy. 10. And so I would imagine 10 kids, but you're also, they probably want to bring a friend. They probably have a girlfriend, boyfriend, right? Yep. Out of all the kids, one of them's married. One of them's in a committed long-term relationship. Uh, the other one's usually a boyfriend or girlfriend here or there. And then the grandkids, there's seven of those. So I'm yeah. sorry, what? Seven grandkids. Are you a grandpa? Yes, I am. I've been you're a grandpa like, for almost- like- you're like 38 years old, man. Yep. I've been a grandpa since I was 29. How old is your oldest grandkid? Uh, I think he just turned 10. What? That's crazy, yeah. man. So is it, yeah, I, I mean, so, you know, it's funny. We, so my kids are, um, you know, 17, 15, nine and seven. And luckily, I, I mean, this sounds I mean this in the most humble way possible. My dad is 75. He does not look or act 75 at all. He probably looks like he's in his early sixties. Um, I just think genetically, like maybe I have good skin or whatever. I I don't look my age at all. Like when I tell people I'm 47, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm 47. But um, I know for a fact that when I go to like my, my nine-year-old and seven-year-olds games, like it's like these 30 year olds, right. These, these people that are like in their mid thirties and I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of them. And it's interesting. Like I always thought, I'm like, man, when my, when, when the nine year old and seven year old are in high school, are they going to be looking over me? Like, is that grandpa or is that dad? I don't really know. But for you, they're probably thinking like, man, this guy has like 15, 16 kids. Like when you guys are all together, because they probably all look like your kids. Yeah. Wow. Man. Yeah. He's, when my uh, when my oldest, I used to take them before they got their first cars and they were working at 16 years old. Is that your brother? No, that's my dad. That's crazy. Okay, so uh, let me get this all straight again. Ten kids, and how many grandkids? Seven. Seven. Seven? Jeez. <laughs> oh my gosh. And how old is Jen, your wife? She's 35. Wow, that's crazy, man. And so this is both your second relationship. And again, I just want to, I want, I really want to serve the guys out there. What did you, what have you learned about relationships or both of you guys, if you guys could just step away from your first relationship, be like, you know, learned a really, f- some valuable lessons there. What would those be for you? Uh, I think for both of us, cause we've actually had this conversation um, for both of us, it's focus on what we can control. Um, don't let anybody else like everything we did was based on somebody else's what they wanted we didn't try to put anything into it for us at all it was always for somebody else and so in a relationship we found that yeah it's a two-way street and you want to be there for your partner but you can't you can't pour from an empty cup so if you're getting nothing out of the relationship and putting everything in and only focusing on somebody else and not focusing on yourself at all, it's not going to go anywhere. I, I, okay. 
I want to talk, I want to lob this question out there to you. And I just want you to think about it for now. But when you say that you focused on other things, do you mean just the kids or are you talking about just the marriage and the kids and neglecting yourself? Or are you talking about also neglecting uh, the, the, the relationship you had with your previous relationship? Well, I can actually, I don't need to think about that. I can answer that right away. Um, it's all in focusing on your partner and making them happy. And then, you know, the presence for your kids kind of falls to the wayside. Uh, neglecting yourself, not doing anything for yourself at all, just doing everything for them. You know, don't go hang out with the guys. Don't go hang out with the friends. Don't, you know, don't even take the time to listen to a podcast or read a book. Um, don't take time to exercise. Everything you do when you're not working is focused on your partner. What can you do to make them happy? And then trying to figure out why they're not happy. You know, you give them all the time, all this attention, and they're still not happy. And then it's, you're not the person you're supposed to be. Wow, man. Yeah. I, there, a lot of men do fall into that trap. In fact, we, and you know, it, that actually comes from, I would say from a, a quote unquote, a perspective. And I'll, I'll say it twice, a perspective of a very selfless, noble place. Right. So you want to applaud men for that because that is actually where their heart is. They're like, well, I can't really think about me. I got to think about them, which is noble. It is. But I think one of the biggest misses and I want, I want to lob this question back out to you is that I personally think one of the biggest misses with that type of approach in your marriage with your kids is that I think I'm giving a hundred percent, but I'm actually probably giving 10 to 50% if I'm really being honest, because if I do everything for everyone else and I don't have any time to actually what you quoted was fill my cup, I'm actually doing the people I love most a disservice. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's uh like I said, you can't it also builds resentment. Yeah. Because if you're if you're if you're sitting there thinking you're putting 110% in and your cup's empty, you, you're barely given 10%. And then you you're like, well, I'm doing all this stuff and I get nothing in return. You start to build resentment and then later on it turns it can turn worse. We see that all the time on social media, especially like you and I were talking before we hit record today in our, in our large uh, data edge group, you know, we've got like 20,000 guys in there. A lot of the posts and a lot of the questions are like, I'm doing the dishes. I'm taking out the trash. I'm, I'm working 60 hours a week. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I get nothing in return. You know, and I do all these things. So we see that theme quite a bit, you know, that, and when I say the theme, I mean, the resentment, was there ever a, when you were in that camp, when you were in that relationship, the previous relationship, was that a resentment brewing in you quite a bit? Absolutely. For the longest time it was. And it was, do you also sense it was brewing in her as well? Yeah, I think so. Because um, we would argue all the time and it was usually over stupid, petty stuff that in the grand scheme of things wasn't important. We didn't, we didn't take time to, sit down and discuss the important stuff. We always argued over the little stuff, you know? So uh, I've I've learned that a lot of times when you hear, you know, your partner nagging at you, there's usually a want in there. Like, you know, they're nagging at you because this is this way, but yet, you know, if you just took the time to pay attention and, you know, listen to what they're saying, even if it comes across that way, you know, she's nagging because, you know, the house is always a mess. Well, you got six little kids running around. It's going to be a mess, but you know, when you're not taking the time to help out, for instance, it's, you know, I get it. Like me, I worked 60 to 72 hours a week back then. And I was always tired when I came home, 12 hour shifts, six days a week, I'm tired. And, you know, she would come home before me. She'd be taking care of kids, trying to clean up, get stuff ready, get dinner ready, whatever. And then I'm like, I just want to relax. And I'm like, well, why is she nagging me? I just worked all these hours, you know, let me relax for a little bit. And, it's it crazy. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. Uh, it's it's burnout. I think really what it is, right? Burnout that turns into resentment, right? It's like the, um, it's like an infection. You know, we always say that uh, emotional resentment is birthed in expectation, right? But it's like an infection, right? It's like it, the burnout is like the cut, right? And then the resentment is like the 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 infection that festers, right? And it just keeps that wound just 
agitated and irritated and it gets worse over time. What, what advice would you give men who are experiencing that right now? And he, I, I, I want to talk to the guys who, you know, really feel that this is the noble thing to do, which by the way, to some degree, it really, really is. But long-term, it's not going to have the intended effect that you think it will. Yeah, no. Um, the best advice that I can give on that is what I've learned with, you know, my new relationship is I come home and it's, it's a, for me, it's a little different. I, like I said, everybody thinks they're, they're an Island, but they're not. Um, like Jennifer, she shows me the appreciation and stuff. So, you know, when people are appreciated, they'll do more, but Actually, I always told them. Yeah. So like when we first got together, I'm like, you know what? I know that what I did in that other relationship wasn't working it didn't work right. And I know the type of person I want to be. I want to come home and I don't care how tired I am. If my kid wants my attention, they get it. If she wants my attention, she gets it. If she wants needs help around the house, I'm going to help out around the house. And she doesn't ask. I just do it. And just because I know that if I can take some stress off of her, then that's going to take stress off of our relationship if there is any. Um, and then I can relax and we can relax together as a family, as a couple. So my advice would be just, you know, be present, you know, don't worry about, you know, when you come home, you just want to relax. That's all fine. Relax with them, you know, help get whatever done that needs to be done and then relax together. If you're just trying to relax while they're trying to go 90 to nothing to get stuff done, it just makes for more resentment. You know, I, I love that presence thing. Um, especially if, even if it's something as low key as relaxing, relax together, you know, if you're going to play, play together, if you're going to do something, try to do it together. Uh, I think over time that when men are just going 90 miles an hour, right, we're working really, really hard. We're doing all this other stuff. We're doing these things over time. What I've seen is that men will suddenly, not suddenly it's gradual. It happens over time. They'll, they'll, they'll gradually start to kind of like isolate and disengage with the family because the burnout will, the burnout, like it or not, guys, the burnout will win, right? The burnout will win. So you'll start to disengage. The resentment starts to build. You'll start to get more distant from your family, maybe a little bit more curt, maybe even a little bit more short with them and your responses and that kind of thing. You know, you mentioned in there appreciation. And that's one of the three basic needs of men is to feel respected, appreciated, validated. But the appreciation thing I think is key because I don't, man, like, listen, sex is great, right? Physical affection is great. But when my wife says, I just want to let you know, I appreciate how hard you work for us. It doesn't go unnoticed. And just thank you for doing that, dude. I feel like the freaking skies open up, man, like that appreciation mm -hmm. aspect. But I want you to share with us because you and Jen seem to really know this about each other. Like she knows this about you. But that doesn't happen, I don't think, by accident. It needs to be communicated. And I think for the most part, men wish so badly, like, man, if if my if if I just had some appreciation at home, that would be amazing. But we don't know how to even communicate that that's a need or a desire that we have. What advice do you have? Well, for me and her, when we first got together, we we talked about our previous relationships. Because we were, when we first started dating and it started getting serious, we were like, look, we don't want this to be, you know, we don't want to go from serious to it's just like it was before. And I asked her, you know, what kind of things did she do? And then she kind of looked at me funny. And I was like, regardless of the relationship, it doesn't matter if there was infidelity on one side or the other and everything else. You had a part to play in your relationship and I had a part to play in mine. So what did you do that you think you could have done better or different? And she asked me the same question. And then I also, you know, told her about the things that I felt I was lacking and she felt she was lacking. And we made it a point to communicate those to each other. So it's the hard conversation. It's the difficult conversation that for everybody, it's different on how you start that conversation, but without even knowing um, what a generative question was, that's, what I did, I, I figured out what a gender question was. And I asked her, you know, like, okay, you're worried that this is going to turn out the same way. So in a year, where do you see us? How do you see us communicating? How do you see us, you know, you know, managing the household together? 
um, what do you see there? Then she would answer the question. I say, okay, well, how about in five years? What do you see? And we just went through it. And she would ask me questions like that as well. So being able to sit down and have the hard conversations and being able to express what you need in the relationship and what can you give in the relationship that's going to make them feel the same thing you do, you know, make, uh, make your wife, how do you make them seen, seen, heard and understood and, you know, what you would like to get out of it as well. I think that's a, that's a remarkable way to have that conversation because uh, when emotional resentment, I think is when it's really set in, right. That infection has set in what normally happens. And I think this happens on both sides is that, and I want you to even think about maybe your previous relationship or maybe even other previous relationships. Cause I know in my previous relationships, what I'm about to share had definitely happened. And that is when emotional resentment has sent set in on one side or both, it's usually both. It's when I come to you and talk to you about my needs, it's all about me because I'm pissed that you haven't fulfilled my needs, right? So I'm like, well, you know, you never do this, this, and this versus the, 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 the conversation, which I would say, this is exactly the conversation what you had with, with Jen is, is the conversation we need to have, which is, this is what's most meaningful to me, but please tell me what is most meaningful to you. Or even starting like with that of like, what is most meaningful to you and how can I be a better support system for you, a better communicator for you, a better husband for you. And I would also like to share with you what's most meaningful to me. And then it's this calm, like level set conversation versus like, why don't you ever do this? Right. You never, well, I don't do this. Well, you don't do that. Right. And you just go back and forth. But is that what you've seen in your relationships as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. My previous relationship, it was, that was all it was. Well, you don't do this. You don't do that. You know, you should do this. You should do that. And it was from both of us. We both did it. Um, but with, with me and Jennifer, we, we just, we're not like that. It's, and I think part of it, a big part of it was because of, you know, the dad's edge and I wasn't part of the Alliance when we got together. And, but just what I've learned from the dad edge was talking with a lot of the men around here, you know, being, just being active in the group, I learned to frame things a little different and think about things different, control what I can control and then come to her and make sure that I knew what she needed, what she wanted, and how to give that to her in the way that was most meaningful to her. So, and it was because of, you know, she went, like I said, when she met me, she told me I was the most patient person she had ever met. And I wasn't always like that. I used to be a rambunctious, snap angry all the time growing up, especially in my 20s. Um, but, uh, you know, learning to be calm and patient and control myself and, you know, keep my emotions under it and think about things rationally without exploding. Help me become more patient. And then with her, it was one night we, we got into a disagreement about one of the kids and I raised my voice and the look on her face when I raised my voice was like this, this fear um, that stems from her past relationship with all the fighting and yelling and stuff. And I joined the DEA the next day. Hmm. What was your, so let me ask you this. This is an interesting question. Do you believe so that I would say that's more of a reactive approach, not a proactive approach. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not blasting you for that at all because that's what I think most people do. And the interesting thing is we'll, we'll usually wait for something like that. Like, listen, the reason the dad edge is even in, in existence is because it came from a horrible reactive situation with my four-year-old son, right? Where I, I always swore to myself because I grew up, you know, in an abusive environment where I was hit a lot and yelled at a lot and verbally abused a lot. And I always swore to myself, I'm not going to do that to my kids. I'm never going to hit my kid in anger. And dad edge started because I spanked my four-year-old son and I didn't think I hit him that hard, but I hit him hard enough to where he lost his footing and he, he toppled over. And that was it. That was it for me. And if I have one regret, Rich, it's like, why didn't I, why didn't I start something like this sooner? Cause I knew it was coming. Like I, you, all the signs were there, like, and, and why didn't I do something sooner? It's, it's almost like no one thinks that they'll go 25,000 miles in their car, but they're like, oh, the engine lights on. I should probably get an oil change now. 
or like, man, half my teeth are rotten out of my face. I should probably go to the dentist right now. We do all these things in our, in other areas of our life that are proactive and not reactive. But I would still say that that is somewhat proactive because maybe it was a breadcrumb that you're like, this is, this is not going to go in the direction I wanted to. And I got to do something about it. But what would you, what advice would you give to men in general when it comes to their relationships about that proactivity mindset versus the reactivity? Yeah. Well, your examples were right on, you know, as far as changing your oil and going to the dentist and stuff. And what I've seen from the dad edge and from, uh, you know, the big group is a lot of them are, you know, they're not proactive. When I first joined the dad edge, I was trying to be proactive from a reactionary point. I knew my marriage was going south. What can I do about it? I reached out, try to find help. And then it wasn't, and I knew about the DEA for a long time. And, you know, I had my reasons for not joining at the time. And, and then it was a reaction that did it. And the problem with reacting, and it's something I talk to my kids and Jennifer about all the time is, you know, reaction is usually from emotion. And when you act out of emotion, it usually doesn't end well. But when you can look ahead and you can see things that are coming based off of how you are, and you take the approach, I don't want to be like that. I want to be this way. This is who I want to be. And you take the steps to get yourself on that path. You're not going to get there overnight. It takes time. It's hard work. It's not easy. Um, but it's better in the long run. But when you react to things, I, I don't like to react to anything anymore. I, I try to respond. I always take time and I think about what is this going to do? What can I control? And how can I stay on the path without having an episode where I blow up on somebody or I get mad at things? Um, I mean, I'll get angry, but I don't react to anything. I always take my time, think about it, and figure out how I want to respond and then move forward from them. So being proactive, like I said, most people aren't. And I really don't have any advice on being proactive. Um, mine is, is, is don't react, respond. But you have to have that pause. That pause is the difference between reaction and, re and responding. You know, I had, uh, I had breakfast with one of our guys, uh, Dave McCray. We call him, we call him McBeard because he's got the epic beard. And he's been in the military for, I think, 20, 20 plus years. And he's worked his way up to very, very high levels and to where his resilience is very, very high. And I had breakfast with him a couple of weeks ago and he said something really interesting because I really want to dig into how is he so resilient? Like, what did he learn? And he shared this quote with me that um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, slow, when you slow down, everything gets a bit more smooth. And when you're smooth, you can actually think more efficiently and you can react, respond faster and better. And, um, so we started going through certain scenarios because I would say for me personally, my reactivity is about call every 10 interactions that I have that could go South. Three of them are, are negative. They'll, they'll go in a reactive state, right? Seven out of 10, I do pretty good. But I, I was asking him, I was like, you know, and we had some big things happen here lately in, in dad edge. One of my best friends and partners in dad edge tragically lost his daughter in a horrible car accident. Um, you know, I was, you know, help, I'm helping him pick up the pieces, obviously carrying his workload, which I, I welcome that for things like that, but it's also, you know, stressful. Right. And, um, I remember the next day after I found out it happened, I was very curt reactive and, and stressful with my family. So I really kind of dove into, and I, I shared that example with Dave and he goes, well, what'd you do? I was like, I went to the gym. That's what I always do. He's like, why do you go to the gym? I was like, well, I go to the gym because I, I work out, I get all, I get all the stress out. And he's like, well, why do you think that is? I was like, I don't know. It's like physical release. Like just get all the stress out. He goes, he's like, it actually isn't that. I was like, what is it? He goes, when you're working out, he's like, that's your thing, right? Everybody has a thing, but when you're working out, what's actually happening is you're slowing down you're slowing down all those crazy ass reactionary thoughts and you're focusing on, you know, the bench press or the squats or, and the, and the technique and your breathing and all this other stuff. And you're slowing down the thoughts, which by the way, calms you down. And I was like, it was almost like 
holy crap, you know, you you feel like you've learned a lot. And then somebody says something, you're like, oh man, this whole new level, I get it now. But, you know, slowing down and being more responsive, right. And, and being able to exactly what you just said, being able to create, you know, that space. What have you learned? I mean, dude, like, listen, 10 kids, 10, right. And seven grandkids. There's a lot of things. And, and you're looking to start your own business. You and I were talking about how I posted up in the, in the group of, uh, just asking men, you know, what's prevented you from joining the DEA. And it was, it was fascinating to me because we had so many comments and so much amazing, beautiful, authentic ownership of men stating their excuses and also stating that they were complete and total BS, right? The reasons that they couldn't do it. And they were even saying all of them, I know that this is complete and total BS. And it's the story I'm telling myself, but here it is. You have all of the, I would say, justifiable information and justifiable things happening in your life. 10 kids looking to start a business, married, seven grandkids, hardly any time. But for you, how, how do you make time for all this stuff? Like your personal growth, your relationships, your education, you know, the things that you invest in you, how do you make time for it? Uh, let's see. Well, um, like for the business aspect, I make the extra time. I, I, I work more than I really want to. Uh, but I know that in, in the long run, that extra time now is going to lead to more free time later. Um, it's about getting rid of that instant gratification, knowing that if I don't work on me, I'm not going to be good for anyone else. And knowing that the sacrifice of time that I make now is going to lead to more free time later. So I have a seven month old right now. And I know that right now, while she's young, I take the extra time to put in the work to where I can do my own thing, start my business and grow my business. By the time she's old enough to have any kind of real acknowledgement and be able to be really be present for her, I'm going to have that free time. And so knowing that I have kids in sports, so it's, it's a grind. It's, it's go, go, go all the time. You know, weekends like this, this past weekend was uh, this straight volleyball tournament all weekend long. So we got one kid who's getting ready to go off to college. She's finishing up her, her club volleyball. She's playing volleyball all weekend long. And so I know me and me and Jennifer, we keep a calendar between the two of us. It's, it's a shared calendar on our phones. We got events coming up. We got things coming up. It, it goes in the calendar. Everything's lined out. What we got going on, who's got what going, what days, and, you know, just like with her, she's going back to school right now. She's doing her first semester online for certain classes. She comes home in the evenings. I take care of the baby. She goes and sits down in the office or in the bedroom and starts working on some stuff. So we both know that when I have to do things that I need to do, I work on those and she manages everything else. And when she needs to do things, I manage everything else. So you guys create a plan and expectation is what you're saying. There, there's really no, I, the, the thing that I'm sensing is there, there's no fluff in like, well, I think I'm doing this and she's doing that. Or like you each know your role in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, um, do you guys set like a weekly meeting? Not really. Um, I know I've always wanted to, um, we've both talked about it, but with everything we got going on with the way we, we organize our days, it's, it's easier just to have a, a few minutes here and there, you know, to discuss things. And there, there's times where I'll forget or I'll know it's on the calendar and I didn't double check it. And I'm like, well, I didn't know. And she's like, well, it's on the calendar. I'm like, well, yeah, that's on me. I didn't look. Um, so, but no, we don't really have any weekly meetings. We should with everything we got going on. But usually it's it's when something goes on the calendar, we'll sit and we'll talk about it. We, you know, we discuss our budget and our bills and stuff. Uh, we're actually going to sit down here. I don't know if it'll be this evening, but uh, here soon we're going to sit down and we're going to reorganize some stuff. You know, we, we plan on it. It's not weekly. It should be, but it's more like every other week, once a month kind of thing for us. Got it. All right, man. Yeah, it, but you're still a, maybe it's not a weekly cadence, but there is a platform through you, 
through where you guys communicate and perhaps it's the calendar, right? And there's probably constant dialogue on dialogue into, Hey, here's my role and here, here's yours. And that versus, you know, ex again, expectation will, the unfulfilled expectations will lead to resentment, which will crumble a relationship, you know, from the foundation up. So uh, as we wrap up here, I want you to just share, you know, we, I've mentioned this before. I can't uh, give credit for this because I, I don't even know where it came from, but I remember seeing something on social media. I think it was Instagram. There's three types of men. There's the victim, the content zombie, and there's the executor and just a level set. I want you to share your story in, in those elements and just for the audience. So the victim, we all know these people in our life. These are the, these are the men that we associate with. And what they're going to do is they're going to tell you every single reason why they can't execute that they are not achieving whatever it is, right? It could be in their business, their finances, their health, their marriage, their parenting, whatever. So that's the victim, the content zombie, even though I would it's a term that we're like, wow, that, that doesn't really feel good. The content zombie is actually a step ahead of the victim because the content zombie has gotten sick and tired of being a victim. It's like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to learn. I'm ready to learn. And what they usually do is they fill their ears, their mind, their heart with information and usually very good information. So they're the podcast listeners. They're the audio books, you know, they're the regular books. They're, they're watching YouTube videos on how to improve something or level something up or whatever. Usually the reason we call them the content zombie though, is because they're so overwhelmed by the amount of information that they are um, taking in that they don't know exactly what, what we call in the DEA, what's the right next thing. We use that question a lot. What is the right next thing? Because that is the stepping stone to action, which the third personality, the third type of man is the executor. The executor simplifies things. The executor takes information, asks himself, what is the next right thing I need to do here? And I'm then I'm going to go do it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to listen to another podcast about it. I'm not going to him haw on. I'm going to go do it. And perhaps if you're listening to this show, you're identifying with where you're at in those three camps. But for you, Richard, I know this is as for everybody, this is a journey, but share your story from, from each one of those steps. Well, um, I was, I played the victim for 15 years. Yeah, probably about 15 years. And then I was like, something's got to give, something's got to change. So I started listening to podcasts, uh, listen to podcasts, reading books. And I became a content zombie for roughly six years. You know, and I tried to implement little things here and little things there, but I wasn't understanding where my actual start point was. It was just trying these little things. And then when I see they didn't work, I'm like, okay, well, I got to, I got to go listen to another podcast. I got to go read another book to try to figure out what I'm doing wrong. And it wasn't until I joined the DEA that I'm like, okay, well now it's time to execute. It's time to, you know, stop just trying to fill my mind and just work and get it done. So for me, um, I'm still a content zombie. I am. Um, when I'm working, I'm, I work in a trade. You go to a job site, there's always a radio playing, music going, whatever. My earbuds go in, podcast, audio books on, I'm working. But when I'm not when I'm not working, when it's time to be home and it's time to execute and actually be there, that's when I try to focus on what's at home. I try to focus on what I've learned. You know, maybe in one of the podcasts I'll hear a quote that really hits me and so you know, I'll come home and I'll share it with Jennifer and we'll, we'll talk about it for a little bit and we'll try to figure out how that goes and fits in with us or with her or with me. And, uh, so mine went from victim to executor. It, it took about 20 years, but it doesn't have to take that long. Um, I was, I played the victim for way too long. And then the content zombie thing, I was a victim and a content zombie at the same time. Now I'm a content zombie and an executor at the same time. Because it's it, you don't have to be one or the other. In my opinion, you can be both, but you can't be at the start and end at the same time. You can't be a victim and executor at the same time. So <clears throat> mine was, I was the victim for a long time, didn't know what to do, blamed my ex on everything. Um, it wasn't until I decided to start changing me um, and start bettering me did I become the content zombie. And then even with bettering myself, my previous relationship didn't work out. Um, 
and then me and Jennifer got together and I'm like, it's, it's, I have to execute if I want this relationship to flourish. I can't just listen to everything and not do something. So that's when I decided to become more of an executor. I still listen, but I put into practice everything I learned and try to do it every single day. And there are days I, I'll slip up and I'll fail and it's not perfect, but I try my best to do what I've learned and stay on the path that I want to be on. Let, let me share this perspective and, and maybe this will hit home. I wouldn't even call you a content zombie. I would call you um, someone who an executor that listens to content content in a very different way. So I remember when I first stumbled on the podcast, I think it was like 2008, 2009, like it was long, long ago. And I started listening to audio books, you know, like Tony Robbins and, and all kinds of things. Right. And I literally, my, my mentality was like, if I'm filling my time to listen to this stuff, then it will just happen. Like things will just happen better. Right. And what I found was, is that that was the missing ingredient was I wasn't executing. I thought it, as long as I consume all this stuff and actually the more I consume, the better, cause I'm just, it's just going to go in there and I'm just going to be a part of who I am. I think that's literally how I thought about it back then. Well, now I, I still listen to podcasts. I still listen to audiobooks, but I listen with this executor mindset of like, okay, I just learned this. How do I go? How I'm going to, I'm going to go do this now. Right. I'm, I'm actually going to go do the thing that I just learned. Right. My, uh, my son and I just got done reading the book, uh, relentless by Tim Grover. Right. One of the chapters was all about, um, you know, cleaners are so focused on the result that they do the work anyway. So basically the whole concept is do, do the things that you dislike, that, do the things that you know is necessary, whether you feel like doing them or not, right? It's the whole motivation thing. Well, I'm not motivated. It's like, we'll do the thing because you're, you're so fixated on the result. So I started really looking at my week through that lens of like, okay, what are the things that I dislike the most? Well, one of them is getting up at 525 in the morning and running three miles before I get in the car and take my son to weight training at high school. And when that alarm goes off and it's so much, so tempting to, to, you know, stay in bed, it's like, no, I, I heard this in the book. I know exactly what this is. I'm going to do this thing, even though I don't feel like doing it. So it's looking, it's, it's still consuming content, but it's looking at your life to where like, Hey, where can I implement these things where I know they need, they're needed most. Right. And then sticking to that. So this, this has been awesome, man. I, I just want to, I want to give you a moment. Um, might seem kind of odd, but you know, in, in the DEA, we, we put you in, in certain scenarios. I want you to think back to you're 38 years old right now. I want you to think back that if you had the opportunity to speak to your 18 year old self, so you had 30 minutes to take your 18 year old self out to dinner, you're literally sitting there face to face with your 18 year old self. And you're like, listen, man, I'm going to save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration over the next 20 years. What would you be telling yourself? I've actually heard you ask that question a lot. And I've thought about that question a lot. Um, Mine would be stop blaming everybody else and focus on what you can control. Uh, it took me a long time to learn that. I was always trying to control everything else, even though I had zero control over it, like zero control. Um, life's hard. It's going to knock you down. But focus on what you what you can do, you know, um, if you, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to work and you're stuck in traffic, you can get mad about it. You can get frustrated. It's going to make your whole day crap. But, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, you know, that consume the content you want then. Don't wait until later when you have free time. Um, use your time wisely and focus on what you can control. Those are the two main things that I would tell myself because I didn't do that for the long, long time. I was always focused on every, what everybody else was doing and I did not manage my time very well at all. Got it, man. That's good advice. That's good advice. You know, we always say you got to be 
uh, young and stupid before you're older and wise. <laughs> man, this was really cool. Um, really enjoyed having you on, man. Um, thanks so much for being uh, giving of your time, especially for you with that many kids, grandkids, your business, everything going on. Uh, time is a very precious thing. So thanks for sharing that with us, man. I was glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you were here, man. Gentlemen, we are wrapping this podcast up. Uh, just want to give a huge shout out to Richard, who's been an amazing asset in the Data Edge Alliance. Um, if this is something that you guys have been wanting to do or something you've been on the fence about, or maybe there was something that Richard really shared that really resonated with you, uh, you guys can head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 95 for the show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 95 for this show. Richard, is there any place in particular that if any of the listeners heard anything that might have hit them in the heart, maybe they want to reach out to you, maybe they want to shoot you a DM, ask you a couple of questions just about your life and your mindset, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I don't do Instagram a whole lot. I'm on there, uh, but on Facebook, it's just Richard Ziegler. I mean, you can always message, message me there. Uh, I'm not going to. I have my emails and stuff through work, but I'm not going to put that out there just because that's I'm yeah. not going to do that. Um, but yeah, just message me on Facebook. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me or Instagram, either one. All right, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you. Well, guys, we'll have a link for that in the show notes. Again, go to the dad edge.com forward slash Friday nine, five for this show. And again, be proactive, be proactive with your relationships, be proactive with your growth. Reactivity is not the way to do it. Also, Focus on what you can control, right? Focus on what you control. And depending on where you're at in those camps, whether you're the victim, the content zombie, or the executor, wherever you're at in those camps, remember, there's always room to grow. Go out and live legendary. Take care.